Thanks very much, Michael, for inviting me here, and thanks to DI for putting on the event. I'm very excited to be here today. Uh, I'm excited because I feel like we're at a, a precipice, uh, a, a new era in election monitoring. As, as Mike mentioned, I've been involved in election monitoring and applying technology to the field of election monitoring for, for over a decade. And, and, and I can feel that we're on the edge of a change. And, so I, and I think that the people who are in this room today are going to be some of the people leading a, rev, a, a revolution in, the, in how election monitoring is done. I'm very excited to be at what I believe is the beginning. Uh, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint a picture for you of where I think election monitoring is going and how you all are going to be involved in it. Uh, but before we, we do that, I do want to, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit first about uh, the use of technology in election campaigns, uh, in, the, in, in the, how parties use technology in campaigns in the United States, because I think it sets a good example for how the method of technology changed the way that organizations are able to, to, to work. And so in the United States, if you look back in the, the 19th century through the 20th century, uh, the mid 20th century, before there was television, before there was radio, the only way to get out to people was to go talk to them. Uh, uh, and, and methods of organizing were, were exactly that. It was community organizing. And there, this was the age of party machines. This was the age where there were big structures of people who, who got out who organized communities, who got them out to vote, who, who brought messages of what different candidates stood for, uh, and who managed that, that organization. In the, in the, the middle, middle in, the, in the 40s through 60s, we, we began to develop mass communication technologies, radio, television, other ways of, 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 uh, of contacting individuals. And in a lot of ways, parties relied on those in order to more effectively and efficiently contact citizens directly, contact voters directly, and they cut out a lot of that organization in order to do that. Those, those entities might still come together around election day, but for the most part, uh, media was used as a way to directly contact citizens. And, and again, this was very useful in certain ways in that it, uh, it allowed a consistency of message, it allowed more control, it allowed them to reach into areas where they might not have strong organization, but it, uh, it, at the cost of reducing the, uh, the, the role and effectiveness of their network, of their structure, uh, and moving them away from those sort of community organizing practices. Then in 2008, the Obama campaign hit upon a way to combine the two. And while they had a very robust media strategy, they also started to uh, get involved in, in organizing people at the grassroots. And they used technology to do this. And so they used practices of, uh, of community organizing uh, that had existed for, for hundreds of years, but they used technology in order to scale that. And they did that by providing data and information to individuals that allowed them to be able to help the campaign and providing opportunities for them to get, convene and to meet with each other. So individuals were able to host house parties and they were able to get all of their friends to come together and they were able to look at voter lists and call out to people, collect information about who might be a, a supporter and who wouldn't be, and then feed that back into the main database, the, the, the information repository. So the individuals, the supporters of that network were part of an ecosystem of taking the information that was, that was uh, being created by the campaign, uh, doing things in their communities more effectively on behalf of the campaign, uh, and providing back information that allowed them to, to continually do this more and more effectively. And this level of engagement, it, it, was, it was good because it was effective, but it also felt right. It felt, it felt like the way organizing should happen. It was much more internally democratic. It was much more uh, parti it was participatory. It empowered the people who are your supporters to not just give you money, not just go vote for you, but really to, to find ways to organize in their community and find ways to affect change related to that campaign. And so individuals were able to create their own media. They created their own videos. They created uh, their own websites uh, for specialty groups and did a lot of work on behalf of the campaign with a very limited staff at the center managing it all because the, 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 the organization, because the, the campaign was willing to devolve power and they were willing to give up control of the brand and control of the message in a way that empowered people. And I think that this is a, a good model for us to keep in mind as we think about uh, the, the evolution of election monitoring as well. So if you look at the, the, uh, the trajectory that election monitoring has taken, again, it, when, when election monitoring started in the, in the 80s and 90s, 
it, was, it also had a, a, a human structure that looked a lot like campaign organizing used to years and years ago. Uh, where you know there were you know, there there were multiple levels of of district coordinators and supervisors and other people who are uh, who created this structure uh, uh, between the the observer headquarters and the uh, observers themselves and again that still exists but the difference was back in in the 80s and 90s this wasn't just the structure of recruiting and training it was also the structure for moving information. All of these people who had checklists and information had to give their checklist to the supervisor, uh, the district supervisor who gave it to the regional supervisor and all the way up, which made it very difficult to collect information, particularly from, from remote places or rural places. And so the sort of information that uh, election monitoring organization was able to get in the, in, in the 80s and 90s, it was, it was sporadic, it was sparse. They might have very good information from some areas and worse information from others. And so that led to election monitoring practices and, and statements that tended to be anecdotal, tended to be uh, impressionistic. They, they made the best guess based on the information they were able to get back of what actually happened uh, and to provide some analysis to that. Then uh, in, the, in the 2000s, between 2000 and 2010, the world changed in an important way. And that was that between 2000, when almost nobody had cell phones, and 2010, everybody had cell phones. Uh, particularly um, uh, in, in uh, countries where election monitoring was going on. At the beginning of, the, of 2000, there were, uh, um, I think, around a million SIM cards in existence, uh, mostly in the West. And in 2000, by 2010, uh, by now, there are nearly 5 billion, sorry, there was a billion at, at the beginning of that decade, more like 5 billion now. Uh, and uh, the, um, the number of cell phones available in developing areas has eclipsed that of the West. So by 2010, there were more SIM cards, there were more cell phones in Africa than there were in North America, uh, or in the U.S. and Canada. And so what that allowed is it allowed election monitoring organizations to change the way that they do business. And they were able to cut out a lot of this efficient, inefficient structure in the middle that slowed down reporting and to allow the citizens to directly report back information. Um, and uh, again, this, this was, it allowed them to be able to do more timely reporting, uh, to collect information more systematically, and to have more detailed information about what was going on so that they could, on election day, not just give impressionistic information or anecdotal information, but give actual statistical and data-driven analysis of what happened in the election that day. And that was a very important revolution in election monitoring and one that I was very happy to have been able to be a part of uh, uh, in my previous work with NDI for uh, quite some time. Uh, but I, and I think that that work is, uh, that important work uh, still continues. Uh, it is important for organizations to have that sort of data. Uh, and uh, my, a, colleague, a colleague of mine, Ahmed Kassim, is going to be talking about how this is, has evolved over time and where we are on being able to apply these sort of techniques. But I want to think, uh, again, uh, encourage you to think about another model in addition to that, not instead of that, but in addition to that where uh, we might be able to re-imagine uh, the role of election monitoring organizations. And this, again, is, is taking a much more uh, community organizing approach to election monitoring. And I think that in the future, in the next few years, election monitoring will look a bit more like community organizing uh, than it does today. Uh, and it, it will, you know, for the geeks in the room, election monitoring will move from being an exercise to providing a platform. That we might begin to think of election monitoring as providing a platform that enables people to be more engaged around their elections. And the way this would work is, uh, is the election monitoring organization itself providing data and information and providing opportunities for convening online, offline, and, and, and providing those tools that allow people who care about the elections in their country to organize in their community and to use information about uh, previous registration rates, about uh, problems that have happened in past elections, and to use that to solve problems in their own community, and from the, while doing so, generating information that goes back to the election monitoring organization that, so that, and, and continues this process of empowering th this group to empower citizens to be more engaged and involved in the process. And I think it's, again, this feels right. This feels like the way election monitoring should be, that rather than taking on an exercise 
uh, on behalf of citizens, that we really empower citizens to be engaged and involved in the process uh, in, in a way that they haven't been able to before, that they haven't been given, empowered to do so to do uh, previously. Um, and again, as, as Mike mentioned in his, in his opening, yeah, election monitoring really has three sets of goals. Uh, it has the goal of making the process better, it has the goal of engaging citizens around their elections, and it has the, the role of providing citizens information to allow them to, deter to evaluate the election and see if it was a good election or not. And I think lately, we've really, with the data that we've had available, we've focused on that last area, providing information but we've maybe lost sight a little bit of, the, of engaging citizens and maybe lost sight a little bit of how do we make the process better overall. Uh, so again, I, I leave this as a, as a, as a suggestion uh, and something to consider uh, for, for the group and something I'm excited to talk to you about over the next few days. So if we wanted to actually implement this, if we wanted to have a more community-driven or, or citizen-based model of, of election monitoring, what would we need in order to do that? Well, one, we, we would need to be able to do a better job of making data available to citizens and making it available in a usable, actionable way. This, this key data provision part of the process. And so uh, there are a few people who are working on projects like this who are going to talk about that later in the day. Uh, Rod Juan, uh, Pazai, uh, Eric Gunderson are a, a few of the people who will be talking to you about some of the work that they're doing to liberate data and to make data available in the Tunisian elections. Another thing that we need to be, get better at as a community is uh, providing platforms to allow people to convene online and offline. Uh, and again, there are a number of people who are working on these sorts of things. Uh, City Vox is doing some great work on that in, in some new mobile apps that they're developing. The iWox folks have been using Facebook and a number of other tools uh, and are thinking about ways to create conversations and convene conversations that feed back into the process. And so again, I, I think that they're going to have an opportunity to talk about that over the next few days. Another thing we need to get better at is collecting information. Um, I, I think you know, we've all seen crowdsourcing used around elections, and there's a lot of curiosity and interest in how crowdsourcing can help with elections. I think that crowdsourcing so far has failed to meet the expectations, and, is, and, and I think that you know, it hasn't quite delivered on the promise. And part of that is, is we haven't really gotten good at collecting the right kind of information that's useful for, 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 for uh, generating insight around elections. So there are a number of ways that we can get better information from untrained people or undertrained people. Some of that is going to be moving past the SMS that we use for our regular observers and using web forms and, uh, and apps and other ways that would allow somebody to be able to provide useful information with less training. And so Matt Berg is going to talk about some of the work that they're doing on FormHub to make it easier for groups to be able to uh, create apps, or, or sorry, create uh, uh, mobile reporting tools uh, on, on uh, reporting tools for mobile phones. Um, uh, Jorge, is going, uh, Jorge Soto is going to talk about some of the work that they're doing at CityVox and how they're using Facebook apps as a way to collect information around elections. Um, uh, uh, our friends from uh, Souktel and, F and Freedom Phone, Brenda from Freedom Phone is going to talk about IVR uh, and ways that they're using uh, mobile phone reporting to allow people to provide more structured information over a call rather than SMS, as a, uh, again, as a way of collecting, making it easier for people who aren't part of your network to provide you information. So these are some of the things we'll hear about over the next few days that we're, we, I think we'll see integrated more, more frequently into election observation and election monitoring efforts. And then another area where we need to get better is processing the conversations that are already going on. People are already talking about elections, and there's a rich set of information that's out there about people's experiences uh, with elections and their feelings about the elections, and we're, as a group, not doing a very good job of tapping that. So there are a few organizations, uh, for instance, uh, Ayman Itani from Think Media Labs, who's responsible, who I shamelessly stole this image from, um, and, um, and Jazam, uh, Jasm, uh, who I don't see here yet, but we'll be talking a bit about some of the work that, that he's been doing uh, to analyze the conversations that are going on on Twitter and Facebook as a way of having better information about people's experiences with, with elections. And I think that, that's sort of um, a, 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 an important point to, to begin to close this down on, <laughs> as Dan, is that it's, uh, in thinking about our role as election monitors, I think we, we focus a lot on the process. 
We focus a lot on the, the, the international standards by which the process is meant to be judged, and that's very important. I mean, it's, the, there, it's been a long road getting uh, agreement that, uh, that there are standards around elections uh, and, and getting countries to hold themselves to that. But the way that people evaluate, was this a good election or a bad election, is not formed on process alone. Process is necessary but not sufficient to make an election good. Uh, and the way that people decide, was this a good election or not, may have to do with, did I, were the politicians the right sort of, uh, do we, did we have good options? Were they talking about things that I care about? Things like, uh, such as that, which are often missed in our uh, evaluation of elections. And so listening to conversations is, uh, and listening to what people are saying is a good way for us to ensure that we're actually speaking to the issues that people care about and evaluating the aspects of an election that are, that are what, really, what people really use to determine whether this served their needs and their country's needs. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very excited to continue this conversation with you. I think that, as, as I said, this, this change is going to happen from people in this room. I think Lebanon and Tunisia are very well situated to be uh, a, a, an incubator for a new approach to election observation. In Lebanon, we have groups that have uh, a rich tradition of election monitoring, election observation, who have been at the cutting edge of applying technology to that work. Lade and LTA are two of those organizations that are here today. And, and, and I think you know, they have the creativity and passion to be able to, to continue to develop this field. At the same time, in Lebanon, I think people who have, who have been really following election monitoring uh, uh, have a lot of respect for these organizations and the contributions that they've made, but there's also a growing frustration that we've been monitoring over and over and over again in Lebanon, and things don't seem to be changing. And so I think that, again, that finding new ways to empower people, finding new ways to make change, finding new ways to engage people and give them the ability to change the situation is going to be critically important for election monitoring in Lebanon to maintain the confidence of the people. In Tunisia, we, we face the, the first elections for a government since a, a revolution that was powered by people, uh, powered by people who are powered by technology. And so I think that, this, again, this will be a critically important election and one where the expectation will be that people will be involved, that it will be citizen-led, that it will be community-driven. And so applying these sorts of practices to the way that we do election monitoring, opening up our information, opening up data, uh, engaging citizens, empowering them to be part of the process at the community level are all going to be critically important uh, in, in Tunisia as well. And so I think that this is a, a, an opportune time for us to have this conversation, and I'm very happy to be here with you to have it. Thank you.